Hey guys, Eric Kaplan here from Axis Golf, and I'm really excited to dive into the fundamentals with somebody who's been really an inspiration and mentor for me. I mean, along with Dr. Berger and Dr. Cooney at the Mayo Clinic, I mean, Allison TG has been instrumental in pioneering the understanding of how the body moves in a facet that is deeper than perhaps anyone in the industry. Um, so Allison, thank you so much for being here. And what we're going to do today, just so that the audience is aware, is we're going to dive through what we call the Swing Fundamental Pyramid. We're going to take people on a journey layer by layer through each and every fundamental and how they would be applied to, which is my background, working people with Parkinson's since 2000, as well as several uh, major champions, five to be exact, on the PGA Tour, and showing you how the same fundamentals, because in fact, something is a fundamental should apply itself to everybody, would. And so a lot of the things that Alice and I talk about is it's frustrating because you'll take a lesson from an instructor who will say, you have an issue where you come over the top or you come out of your posture without understanding this is a symptom or a result of perhaps a misunderstanding of what in fact each fundamental is all about. So we're gonna take you on a journey today is basically a step-by-step -step analysis of what this pyramid is um, and the language of instruction that we've been speaking um, since 2000. So we're gonna have some fun today going through that. So, and again, Allison, thank you so much for being here and are you ready to dive in? Um, and thank you for having me. Really excited about this. It's, it's going to be great to work with a professional like yourself that um, wants to dive deeper and understands how important it is to get this information into the hands of amateur golfers and professionals. There's, there's much more that professionals can learn from us as well. For sure. So what we're going to do is we're going to show people a dive into how you know, these ideas were developed, which I think is important to understand as well. Because if you don't understand you know, the experience um, behind going through and analyzing the golf thing and actually understanding in real time, um, there's no real depth to understanding and being able to explain to a student. There might be some fundamentals that are here, but there also might be instances by which you want to tweak certain things in different ways. Absolutely. Based upon, based upon injury, um, based upon, you know, scar tissue, anything else might be there that might be a limiting factor. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of these fundamentals, define them for what they are, and then perhaps give an illustration or two where some adjustments might apply, which is, I think, important to understand as well. You bet. So when we dive into these pieces, we're going to start off going through the first layer, because these are literally the most fundamental elements of the golf swing. Somebody might talk to you about rotation or pressure shift, and but without the proper elements of the bottom layer of the pyramid in place, these yeah. are difficult, if not impossible, to, to accomplish. Yeah. So again, let's say somebody has an issue with a pressure shift. If that's something that they want to do in the golf swing, which is shift their pressure from right leg to left leg for right-handed golfer, if their stance width is not correct, we're not going to be able to accomplish that correctly. Yeah, or we're, so, or it's going to inhibit, and um, you know that then there's a cause and effect that happens from there. Or so, so regarding stance width, I know that um, you know my background working people with Parkinson's, one of the most clear things that we see is balance deficits. And for somebody with Parkinson's, if their stance width is too narrow or too wide, they're going to have a tendency of falling off balance one way or the other. And so one of the things that I heard growing up, like everyone does, is when you play golf, how far do you want your feet? What, what would be the most, you know, yeah. and so what, what would be the most common thing that people talk about regarding stance width? Um, beginning with shoulder width, and then the stance gets wider as the club gets longer. That's the most traditional if we want to go all the way back to Bobby Jones and, you for know. Sure. But, but even that invites extra variables, which is going to influence ball position, other things like that. So having a variable stance width actually invites more variables as well as less consistency to the game as a whole. And yeah. so one of the things that's intriguing is, you know, most instructors, you know, especially those going through um, the process of repetition of what other people were teaching them, would say that a guy like Jack Nicholas has shoulders that sit exactly the side of his hips. Therefore, it would be prudent for him to be shoulder width apart but it might not be true for everybody. And so yeah. what we're gonna dive into is that, you know, the, the proper stance width is not proportioned to the shoulders, but rather proportioned to the hips. And so- In a perfect world, for, for sure, but I've, I've seen tour pros, and this is the stuff we're gonna get into with you for sure. public here, is there are tour pros, and I don't know if it was Adam Scott or Fowler that I had on video, and you know, with their drivers, they got these really wide stance. Well, when he can't, comes to a full hip turn, his foot drags, his right back foot, he, you know, when he's already on, posted up on the left side, belly button's facing the target. But in order to get his pelvis all the way to the left, 
that right foot drags nearly six to eight inches. And I had it on slow motion. So that's the kind of stuff we're going to talk about is if you're 23 and you're on the PGA tour and that forward motion is going to give you a little more umph, that's great. But if you're fifth, over 50 and you're an amateur golfer that plays three times a week, I'm going to say no way. No, no <laughs> question. Take it easy. Narrow the darn thing up. Yeah, for sure. And so what I, you know, what I discovered through, again, quite a bit of experimentation is that the proper stance with somebody with Parkinson's and what um, Berger over at, at Mayo would say is more of an anatomically stable stance with would yes. be if you were to, again, I'm going to use more elementary terms. We're going to dive into it a little bit more to be in a position by which I'll stand up for a second um, where the outside of your hip should be where the instep of your foot is to be really simplistic where the outside of your hip the instep of the foot. And this would be a consistent stance with for everything in the bag, whether it be a full swing sandwich or a full swing driver. And that's one of the first things we did with a guy like Bernhardt Longer is we said, oh, by the way, you have one stance with for every club in the bag, as well as one ball position. Driver, of course, a little bit more forward because it's off fatigue. But the fundamentals of keeping stance with constant, I think, is important. And so if you can kind of shed a little bit more light when I say, you know, get your feet just uh, the instep of the feet in line with the outside of the hips you know, what more substance, you know, to that is there? Well, the, the addition would be is somebody that's overweight. Right. So if, if, we, if they had, let's say somebody's 50 pounds overweight, they carry in their lower body, maybe a woman that's pear-shaped and she has a hip, and her bone structure, the pelvis, let's say from right, the very tip of the pelvis from right to left, let's say that's only eight inches. Right. But her body mass For sure. adds an additional 12 inches to the width, so in that scenario, you can't go by the outside because if you drop that club, it's too wide. Gotcha. Amazing. So there are certain, if, if they're having problems transferring their weight and balancing, if, if they're already taking a stance and they're actually biomechanically, or I'm not going to say biomechanics, body mechanics, if they're in good position, we're, we're, as far as what you and I like to do, we want to help people. I don't want to go in and completely disrupt their swing. So right. if somebody's actually doing well in that weight shift and there's no reason for me to change it, I, I may not even change it. Again, that's where this individualism comes in. But body mass is going to change. And so I used to tell uh, clients, if you really want to be specific about it, take a tape measure when you get in the shower, find the top tips of your pelvis, measure it and then add two inches to each side, that's your perfect width. For sure. So. Um, and, and so that's what's interesting to talk about women having an hourglass build, whereby if they're working off of shoulder width apart, you know, they're going to be 10 times out of 10 too narrow for themselves if their shoulders are... Very much, because some women... Have, I have really wide shoulders for a five foot two, but that's where anatomy really dictates function. 100% um, the form dictates. Big time, yeah. So being able to know how to find somebody's joints and bones as, as you know, what, what we're trying to do, that really, that gives us the information we need to make an educated decision on each portion of the swing, primary, secondary, takeaway, backswing, and on up. That's why one swing model does not fit all. There's a sure. lot of variables. And that's the thing is what I take a look at is I take a look at a student, whether it be a Bernhardt or anybody I've been worked with on tour, is I'll, I call them windows of tolerance, by which, you know, this might not be where the fly in the ointment is. They, they find their own compensations. It might be something that's rooted in here or here or there that would provide a lot bigger gain or marginal benefit than focusing yeah. just on this. I pick your battle. A hundred percent. That's the thing is it's important to, you know, you call it skill stacking or something like that term where it's important to take a look at really one thing at a time uh -huh. and identify what that is. Right. And, and sometimes group. as teachers, we can apply one. I, I don't know if this happens to you, but I can see something on bottom mechanic wise and say, I'll tell you, these are the first two things that have to change. And yet when they implement it, it really, they cannot hit the ball squared. And that's a nervous system thing. So that's where we as teachers, again, have to go back and say, even though that is correct, and even though it's based on science and it's foolproof, we know it's best for them. There's something about that, that their brain is just not sinking and they can't hit the ball. And then, so that's where we as teachers, if we have all of those, that whole list that you have, and we actually know body mechanics and biomechanics, we can yeah. actually know how to alter and, and manipulate that to work uh, for the good of the client. For, the for sure. And that's what's interesting is, you know, if I had a couple of players, you know, really high end amateurs, and we're going to talk in a second about secondary tilt, which is the 
translation hip forward, what you know, old school instructors might even call axis tilt, to drop the trail shoulder. I've had some students who are so shallow, they get stuck so far from the inside, they started shanking the golf ball. For a student like that, it would be beneficial to actually create a little bit of negative tilt if they were playing in a tournament the next day, by which it's going to go ahead and steepen the angle of attack to prevent the shank. And so again, yes. that's... Yes, but, and that's where you and I as a team, I, that's not a judgment call I would make. So that's right. why we as a team work so well, because I would not, I, I wouldn't want to have to make that call. I'm used to having my clients more long-term. And if For they sure. had a, 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 you know, you, you would know that and be able to make that adaptation. And that's something that I would have never thought of. Just hearing you say it now, I'm like, wow, that's really good. I never thought of it. <laughs> and, and I think that comes with being on tour since 2014 and saying, you know, every once in a while, you're going to get a tour player that comes up to you that you've not worked with in the past and saying, I'm really struggling with X, Y, or Z. And typically my answer is going to be, if you're looking for me, you know, for help on a Tuesday before a tour event, I probably should be talking in the first place. We don't have enough time to implement the proper number of repetitions for this to really become cemented for you to play in what we call right. the zone. Um, but if it's one of those things where it is literally shank after shank after shank, you know, not just talking about weight distribution could be important, but also taking a look at a little bit of negative tilt to steepen the angle of attack to mitigate what would be the big error as well. So every once in a while you need to kind of dive in a little bit deeper to say, hey, I know the rules, but there might be an instance by which you need to take a look at things in a different way, which I think is super important. Yes, and when I was on tour as a personal trainer, we never talked about their swing. So yeah. they would not come to me for that. I was just their personal trainer, but it was watching those tour pros on tour is what taught me what are the basic fundamentals of biomechanics, and that's how I came to the conclusions I did. For sure. And when I tried to apply it to amateurs, um, it was much harder than I thought. And that's how I developed the whole system of trying to For sure. uh, make the foundational fundamentals and teach them one piece at a time because they clearly didn't move like a tour pro. <laughs> and that's the thing is, you know, you know, you having worked with, you know, Tom Watson and Phil Mickelson and Stuart Sink and Justin Leonard, as well as Brad Faxon, you know, you were exposed to some of the best moves in the game. And, you know, we're able to extrapolate a lot of the insight by which how somebody should move and then be able to say, what's a fundamental? How does that apply to everybody? And again, if, you know, for me, what I say is whether I'm working with, you know, Bernhard or Roy or Patrick Reed or any of these guys that had the pleasure with working with on tour, all this stuff for me was developed as an effort to help people with Parkinson's disease play golf with better balance and with, with reused tremors after my own father was diagnosed. And so literally in a first lesson with a tour player or beginner, I'm saying for as long as you fit somewhere between those two thresholds, these pieces will help you as well. As long as you put the right pattern, the right sequence together based upon your needs. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, that's very true. So, so let, let's dive into the next elements of primary tilt, which is weight distribution. And I know that the PGA manual for instruction, it actually says, that when you play golf, you want to be in athletic position with weight on the balls of your feet. And of course, what's interesting is might be athletic, but for the wrong sports, perhaps, from what they're trying to define. Um, and one of the things that I saw is I put together my very first clinic when I was probably 11 or 12 years old for people with Parkinson's. And there was one student in particular named Leonard Redlick who would show up to my clinics with what seemed like full body armor because he would make swings and fall forward on his face. Now, I had a great instructor going up, growing up. He was actually a low amateur at the Masters in 92. And so he was telling me the same thing that he read in probably Tiger Woods' book, you know, how I play golf, which is, you know, I get my weight on the balls of my feet. For me, what was so frustrating is that the more that I parroted what this guy was telling me when I was young trying to help these people with Parkinson's, the more often they'd fall forward. And so what I saw with my father, who's working with quite a few therapists at home, again, he was diagnosed when I was probably five or six years old. So he, by the time I started trying to help people with Parkinson's, I already had a little bit of, of influence based on what he was working on as well. And what he was working on at home was not just learning how to get up and out of a chair, but also gait patterns, which is the moment he would get the weight too far forward onto his foot, he would start what we call a stutter step and then falling. Yeah. And one of the things that the PT that he was working with worked with him on was hinging over the ankle a little bit even before starting his gait. Yeah. And so in me applying that idea of hinging with weight more over the ankles with even Leonard Redlick, um, for him, it was the first time that he was able to swing without falling. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that we're going to dive into just quickly is, you know, weight distribution in the golf swing. You know, what we understand to be true is the body, you know, using your terminology of plumb lining, you know, is designed not to carry weight on the balls of the feet. Yeah, that's not center. 
for sure. So, so, so let, let's give an inkling in terms of anyone watching what in fact would be fundamentally sound um, regarding getting the weight back, you know, more over the ankles as opposed to the balls of the feet. Well, historically, um, skeletal anatomy and it, almost anyone that's been in a chiropractor's office or been in a orthopedic surgeons and uh, they have the skeleton where you've got the front view, the back view, the side view, and they've got the horizontal plumb lines and the vertical. What they're saying in those pictures that have been around forever, that this is ideal. If you could get your skeleton lined up in this position, it's ideal. Probably there probably isn't a human that's actually in that position unless you could dangle them from a string and let gravity really have its way, you know, you know what I mean by dangle them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so their whole body weight just goes down with gravity and pulls the joints into their perfect position. Um, so center to the human body is ear, shoulder. If I'm a side view, if I turn sideways, it's going to be ear, shoulder. It should go straight to the elbow if the shoulder and the shoulder socket's in the right position in scapula, wrist, hip, knee, ankle. So that has always been center for the human body. I, it's really interesting. You know, there's so many people that don't know that. And when you're in good posture, which we're going to get to in a minute, in neutral spine, yeah. when you're in that position, somebody, it'll literally line them. They're, you can see the whole body line up perfectly and their weight will stack directly over the ankle and heel. And so one of the things that, you know, I picked up from you as well is the differences between being quad engaged versus hamstring and glute engaged. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that golf pros would say to a student is, I want you to stay in posture. I don't want you to early extend. You know, I want to teach you how to compress the golf ball. I want to get your lower body rotating faster. But for anyone out there who has the weight on, let's say, the ball of the foot, if I'm leaning forward, my lower body cannot clear in the downswing. It can, but it's very hard on the hip and very hard on the spine. For sure. And your ball position, if you are historically, if you sway forward on the balls of your feet, yes, that ball is too far away. You almost have to use more upper body, which is for me, upper body facilitates and leads people who cast. For sure. Do not start your downswing with your upper body rotation. You don't unwind your shoulders. The shoulders unwind all by themselves. <laughs> yeah. So, but when their weight's too far forward, that ball's too far away. Yeah. If you get them then in the right setup and have them shift first, the club's going to drop down into the slot. They're going to start coming from the inside, and that ball's going to be four inches too far away. There's no question about yeah. that. Yeah, so all of those things. So body mechanics, swing mechanics submit to body mechanics, not the other way around. And I often say there really is no such thing as swing mechanics because there's not. There's only body mechanics. The, the, the club doesn't swing you. No. Yeah. And the club in it, and a lot of times you talk with a PGA pro and they talk as if, well, this is the golf swing. Well, right. no, there is really no such thing. There's just body mechanics. You just happen to have a club in your hand because the structure dictates the function. So, mm -hmm. you know, anyway, but hopefully we're going to be able to get this information into the hands of, of golfers themselves so they can empower themselves to start tapping into body mechanics and get away from some of the, you know, the fluffy, um, snake oil salesman stuff. I'm going to fix your swing with this one move. <laughs> right, exactly. And so again, it's more about the understanding and not so much what I would say is it's not about redefining fundamentals, but refining our understanding of what these are. Yes, absolutely. And knowing what's truly a fundamental and what's foundational to every swing and what's a variable. Where can we cheat? Where can we allow the little differences to come in? And like you mentioned earlier, the injuries. I mean, yeah. if somebody has pre injuries or somebody cannot get in neutral spine, which is where you're going next, yes. if they can't get into neutral spine, what is the next, you know, what is the next alternative? How do you decide? How do you go through that process of elimination, which is what we're going to be doing in the future together? For sure. And so that's where... Um, the next piece we're going to talk about is neutral spine. And so again, I, I would be cautious to listen to any instructor who says, keep your back straight. Because as you and I know, the back itself is not straight based on who you're approaching or asking. They're going to say that the back has a certain number of curves to it. And so yeah. just to define them, you know, we'd say there are between three and four between who you're asking, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. And the one thing, you know, my wife being one of the leading sports chiropractors out of Miami, is she would say is the reason why you have these curves of the spine as in any chiropractic manual that you would read, they're the shock absorbers of the body. Yeah. And so anytime that you lose one of these curves, it will employ, um, you know, a sticky spot, if you will, you know, just kind of use more of a layman's terms for it. 
And so not only would it be detrimental, you know, to be in a position where there's increased flexion of the spine by which you lose your lumbar curve, yeah. it also would be detrimental in terms of, you know, perhaps protracting the shoulders a little bit more and inhibiting your ability to make a rotation. Yes. And so it would be important to keep the spine in whatever neutral position is neutral for you. So I'd love to kind of dive into that a little bit more. Well, yeah, that for you sure. Know? Because again, yeah. neutral for one person is not always neutral for another. Right. And actually, the, the term neutral spine, um, I don't use that a lot anymore. And the reason being, there's no such thing. It kind of goes back to saying there's no such thing as swing mechanics. If we really want to dive deep, the spine is always in motion. For sure. It, it's, not a, it's nothing that is ever stand still. And it changes as we age and it changes sure. based on injuries. So what I like to do and what you and I are going to be working on together is called neutral torso alignment. It's still called the box, but in a little deeper understanding, you're moving three bones of this torso that support the spine. Right. So instead of trying to find neutral spine, you're going to find neutral rib cage, neutral scapula, neutral pelvis, which puts each individual person in their particular neutral spine as close as we're going to get for their age, their injury, yada, yada. I have people with scoliosis. Well, that is neutral. Right. So we can't feel our spine and we can't see it. So what we've done in developing the box and some other deeper understanding of that is we're going to move ribcage, scapula, and pelvis. That moves the spine. And that's a you know perfect thing of what we're going to talk about next, which is kind of the synergy of these concepts to create what we call the primary tilt, which is how do you maintain these elements. And one of the things that you know people have talked about in the past is you want to push your butt back. Well, if you're not in the box, you know, you're going to compromise the position of the pelvis, which is not a good thing. And that's where you get a lot of other systems in place that try to get you to adjust the pelvis on one of the 88 yeah. degrees of the range of motion yeah. the pelvis itself has. So that's where what we're not saying is we're not saying, hey, we want you to just isolate the pelvis and push your butt back. That would create hyperlordosis. You know, we if they do a yeah, if they do a pelvic tilt, yeah. That, that doesn't help yeah. anybody. That's the that's the cue, stick your butt out. Yeah. That's yeah, and then they always do. They arch their back and they stick their butt out. That's not it the is, same thing. Also, as it's going to cause rib cage flare, which is also not a great thing either when it comes to creating any bit of external rotation of the trail arm. Yeah, if you increase curve in the lower lumbar spine, yes. it's always going to pop the rib cage up. So, and those are the great things that we're going to help hopefully be teaching the average person is how does that work? Yeah. Well, there's there some real elementary fundamentals that anybody can learn and they'll be able to apply it to every area of their life. hundred percent. And that's where, you know, the synergy of those ideas, what I would say is it's not about pushing the butt back. It's about getting into a primary tilt by keeping the shoulder blades down, hinging the thighs back until the toes come up. Yeah. So the butt moves straight back. It doesn't tilt in, 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 in with an arch in your back, your butt, when you just did that, it's a yeah. horizontal line. Your butt started here. It moves straight back. For sure. And that's what's interesting. So when, yeah. So it's this way. Yeah. It's like an archer drawing back a bow. You're yeah. going to have touch in both places. And what's interesting about that is know that a buzzword of late has been, you know, ground reaction force and vertical force, and how the pelvis works up. You know, what we're talking about here is actually, as you would say, it's an optical illusion. Not working up. For as long as, you know, the pelvis itself is on an inclined plane. As you rotate, right. of course, this is going to look like it's working up. Yeah. It's being on the same exactly. plane. So I can't tell you how many clients I have gotten over the years when that became the new buzz. I mean, it just yeah. drove me crazy because if you understood body mechanics, you would have never said that because it oh, doesn't sure. work up. It's already at a tilt. Yes. And this is my belly button. Let's say I'm going to put that right there. Yes. All right. So here, my pelvis is on this tilt. Okay. So if I move and rotate my pelvis, what direction is that moving? Yeah, up. It's moving up, but the pelvis itself is not moving up. It's just at an angle. Instead of it being here in square, it's tilted because of the hinge. So it's a, what I, this is what I call, we're going to do a series on optical illusions, where when you look at a swing and then you say, oh, this is what I see and this is what's right. going on. If you don't know body mechanics, you really have no idea. Mm -hmm. And that you is a welcome. flawless example of some of the ridiculous, the straightening of the left knee and, and pull the pip and the pelvis up. It's like, it's, it's, actually a risk, it's, a risky for, it's a risky for injury because it's going to lead to SI dysfunction, you know, SI instability, and perhaps it be what somebody would call sciatica because left right. side joint is fixated, the right side is opened up, and all of a sudden you're putting pressure on the sciatic nerve on both sides of the perspective. 
Exactly. And you know, we're going we're to go through and look at some of the videos. We're going to look yeah. at videos of Nicholas and, and a lot of those players and some of the old Golf Digest layouts. And you're going to see their belt buckle appear as if it's going up. And that's the pelvis is stable. It's just at an angle. Yeah. It's like looking at the shoulders. The shoulders don't actually move up. The shoulders are stuck to the torso. The torso is rotating so you visually see the shoulder go up. Yes. But the shoulder in and of itself isn't trying to go up towards the sky. You know, it's For sure. rotational motion that causes an optical illusion. For sure. And so, again, just to kind of summarize, we talked about three things. So what we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to talk about the secondary tilt. We're going to talk about scapular engagement, what you would, you know, coin as being the rectangle versus in the box, how this concept influences your grip based on the position of the humerus. Totally you know, whether the shoulders are in what I'd say scapular engaged, yes. as well as how that influences the alignment of the shoulders, whether they're open, closed, or square, as well as your ball position. So that's what we're going to dive through next. But to kind of give you a kind of a bird's eye view regarding where I kind of, for lack of a better word, stumbled into this was watching my own father who had Parkinson's and he had with it a resting tremor. So in 2000, there was a wonderful article that was published um, that basically said that motor function will inhibit a resting tremor. So with my father, what I saw at the dining room table is if he sat in the slouched position, you know, like this, we would still see the tremor. Mm -hmm. you know, my mother, like most parents would say, hey, honey, sit up straight, get your shoulders back. The moment he did this, that tremor stopped. That's such a great story. And so that's, that's and what I saw with, story. and what I saw working with Leonard Redlick, who again was my first student, I met him back in 2000 is he also had Parkinson's. He had an issue by which he put a ball on a tee and before pulling the trigger, because of course, once he's in motor function, there's no more tremor. But before we pull the trigger, we'd still see the shakes. And so what I had him do is I did the same thing where he would say, pinch his shoulders back. And all of a sudden he created enough stability by which he could even pull the trigger back. And what I saw that was so awesome was if he began with that pulling action, you know, of the shoulder blade that we're going to talk about in a little bit, not only did it get rid of the moving parts to create a bigger turn, but the turn was substantiated based on getting the shoulders in a more neutral position, whereby if he was here, he couldn't create a big, a big turn. He lost a lot of distance and power by getting them back. All of a sudden that turn itself got a whole lot bigger. So what we're going to do um, in our following segments, is we're going to dive through the secondary tilt. Then we're going to talk about the takeaway, the pressure shift. Again, if you want one uh, rotation, the scapular glide idea, we're talking about shoulder elevation, arm flexion, downswing, et cetera. But I can't thank you enough, you know, before we dive into the next piece for, um, for being here and for helping the entire golfing industry understand that what they've been saying is not wrong, but there might be a different way in which we could look at each of these fundamentals because our goal is to grow the game. And the more people that are speaking the same language helps the entire game across the board grow. Exactly. So, it's ideal. The medical industry, this is worldwide, has the sure. same language. Just like if you went to a piano teacher here and a piano teacher in France and one in Africa, they all know which fingers lay on the piano and there's a name for every chord. And the medical industry has already established it. It's time for the golf industry or all sports to learn body mechanics, learn the proper language. Instead of having every teacher comes up with their own language, it's just too convoluted. And it would just make it easier. Like you said, it's, it's for the sport. If you love the sport, let's everybody get on the same page. There's been official names for these movements for a long time like make you me one right shoulder elevation arm flexion that's just elbow flexion here's elbow extension it's in every anatomy book in every language in the world why would somebody try to create something new a weight shift like you what you that pressure tilt every yeah. time you walk you shift your weight from the right to the left leg to the right leg <laughs> and what's interesting is you can do that without lateral motion of the head if yes if you if you're proper body mechanics and proper footwork what I call footwork that's yes. exactly what happens and when people start um, when the elderly people they start walking flat-footed I said call it the beginning stages of the shuffle you'll yes. often see them do this and yes. that's because they're not using their feet so I'm not saying you know that the feet have a whole lot to do in the golf swing what I'm saying is is knowing the facts of body mechanics and it's not that hard you've got three right. joints in your arm three in your legs three primary bones of the torso. That's it. It's nine. You have right. to understand those nine primary joints and that's it. So um, th this is going to be so fun going through it. Oh, for sure. So what we're going to do next is we're going to dive through that next layer. Um, but again, thanks so much for illustrating 
what fundamentals are and how they would be applied to the golf swing for a golfer, for any golfer for that matter. So thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Eric. For sure.